Welcome to the fire, welcome to the mountain of his holiness, listen to the choir, sing redemption song of the nation. Welcome to the river, welcome to the waters of forgiveness, he's able to deliver Adam's sons and daughters from the curse of death. Welcome to the table, welcome to the broken body poured out of wine, willing soul. Now to come and dine. 
Welcome to the fellowship of saints redeemed, all rejoicing gladly. Full adopted sons and daughters of the King. Welcome to the throne room. Welcome to the place of elders' crowns cast down. Risen Lamb makes all new. Every tongue and every nation together. Welcome to the fire. Welcome to the mountain of its holiness. Listen to the choir. Sing redemption song of the nation. Welcome to the mountain of his holiness, listen to the choir, sing redemption song of the To the kingdoms of my heart, bow to the kingdom of the Christ. Your kingdom come, your will be 
change my heart, revive me again, make me new. Well, hello and good morning. Welcome to North Park. It's so great to gather with you all. And if you are new to North Park, I want to especially welcome you. We're so glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll be encouraged as you engage in this service today. Uh, as we all intentionally enter into this time of worship and prayer and learning together this week, whether you're joining us in real time here on site uh, or through the live stream or sometime throughout the week, uh, it's our prayer that you would just be encouraged in your faith and challenged to grow uh, and blessed by a sense of God's presence uh, with you as we take this time together. So take a breath. Uh, if you're here on site with us, go ahead and stand and let's lift our hearts and our voices to God together in worship. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Fleeser, and I'm one of the worship leaders here, and really glad and overjoyed that we can get to do this again. And um, yeah, I just want to open up with the scripture. So would you um, follow along with me as I read Psalm 100? It's a psalm of thanksgiving. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, his unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Let's worship. Feel free to as we begin in worship. Today, and we won't be quiet. We 
shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today we won't be quiet we shout out your praise Let's pray. God, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning. We're grateful that your spirit fills us, empowers us, and beckons us to just worship you. And Lord, this morning we offer ourselves holy and sanctified offerings onto you, Lord, knowing that you are in the process of making us pure and holy and unblemished before you, Lord. Would you accept this time? Would you accept our best this morning as we glorify you? Jesus' name.
one more time and let's sing that really meaning what those words mean it is God's breath in our lungs that is giving us life and so as we continue to worship may we sing this like it's our last breath that we can give one to him it's your breath
every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, Jesus, the name above every the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we pray for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none besides you open up this morning.
Amen. Well, you can go ahead and be seated. My name is Trish Hawk. I'm the pastor of care ministry here at North Park. Uh, usually in our services, as we kind of bring that first set of worship to a close, we have a moment of prayer, uh, and we are going to do that today. Um, I wanted to start by mentioning that most weeks we put a call out to you uh, asking for you to provide practically for the needs of the London community, and uh, you always respond generously to support community partners like Sanctuary London. Uh, and so this week we're taking a break from our drive through donation drop-offs, and instead uh, we would like to call you to prayer. Uh, and to pray for another community partner uh, that we have a relationship with here at North Park, the London Pregnancy and Family Support Center. And they're specifically asking for our prayers um, this week as their ministry and especially their workload has been deeply impacted in this season. Um, if you're not familiar with their work, the Pregnancy Center cares for individuals and families who are facing an unexpected pregnancy, and they do this in so many ways. It includes support groups, prenatal and parenting classes, counseling, grief support, help with practical needs, and much more. Uh, and so they actually recently reached out to us uh, to share that they have experienced a fairly dramatic increase in the requests for help that they are receiving. And so they're asking that we would hold them in in prayer as they continue this important work. And so in the week ahead, uh, we're calling you to pray. We're asking that you would um, remember the London Pregnancy and Family Support Center in your prayers this week. And we're also going to take some time in our service today to pray for them. And so would you bow your heads and join me in lifting up the Pregnancy Center in prayer now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up to you now the staff and volunteer team at the London Pregnancy and Family Support Center. God, we thank you for the important work that they're doing, offering compassionate care and practical help to families dealing with an unexpected or complicated pregnancy. As they have shared, and as you already know, Lord, their work has become more difficult and more complicated in this season. And so, Lord, we pray for their team, for Lori, Linda, Stephanie, and Rachel, and for all the volunteers that they lead we ask that you would provide for their needs, encouraging them, filling them up, strengthening them, and equipping them with the resources that they need to support those that you've placed in their care. We pray that you would grant them rest and give them joy in the work that they're doing. We pray you would protect their health and help them to live within the boundaries of their limits, trusting that as they offer what they have to give to those they serve, it's you, Lord, who are carrying the weight and doing a great work in the lives of their clients. We also lift up to you now the many families in our city who are struggling because of an unexpected pregnancy. God, we know that welcoming a new baby into the world can be one of the most joy-filled, meaningful, and beautiful experiences in the lives of parents, but we know that there are many things that can steal away that joy. And so in the midst of the many challenges that families are facing today, God, housing instability, food insecurity, increased conflicts in relationships, heightened anxiety, spousal abuse, addictions, mental health difficulties, and ultimately so many more challenges than we can even say here. God, it's easy to imagine the stress that an unexpected pregnancy can place on mothers and fathers and grandparents. And so, Lord, Lord God, in the midst of all of this, we pray for hope. We pray that these families will not feel stuck or pressured into making a decision that will cause them pain or shame or regret. We pray that they will have the courage to reach out, and as they do, that they will find that there is help available. And we pray through the work of your Holy Spirit that you would mobilize not only the pregnancy center, but also the community surrounding these families to provide for the practical needs that must be met, as well as the emotional and spiritual needs that can provide them with stability and hope. God, we also lift up to you today those who are, have experienced such hopelessness that they felt they could not carry through with their pregnancy. Lord, we know the deep pain that they're carrying, whether their experience was recent or not so recent, and we ask for your healing hand on their lives. And we especially pray for staff and volunteers on the team at the Pregnancy Center who walk alongside those who are grieving and processing what they've been through. We pray that you would fill them with grace and wisdom and love and that you would strengthen and re refresh them as they enter into the heaviness that their clients are carrying. And finally, Father God, we pray for these little lives that are just beginning and waiting to be born. We remember now that each one of them is so precious, created in your image and deeply loved. 
and that you, as you work in the lives of their families, we pray that you would protect them and that you would use this season to prepare a place for them where they will experience loving arms to hold them and care for them. And would you instill in them a deep sense of how loved and valued they are in your sight. God, we know that parenthood is not easy, and yet the challenges of parenthood can so powerfully enrich people's lives, strengthening their character, adding purpose and meaning, and deepening their joy. And so we pray for those facing an unexpected pregnancy in this season, asking that you would give them a hopeful vision for what their parenting journey could be. And we ask today that you would bless the work of the Pregnancy Center, continuing to work through them to bring hope and new life into the lives of families in our city. Heavenly Father, we ask all of this through your Son, Jesus, and by your Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, before I turn things over to Pastor Paul, I just have a few things to let you know about this morning. First off, I'll just quickly mention that today is the very last day that you can complete your elder affirmation voting. Uh, and so this is an announcement for those who are members. If you're a member, you, have, you will have received an email with the details along with a link where you can cast your vote. And you have until the end of the day today to complete it. Uh, this is a vote seeking, seeking to affirm Anita Kraus Wiebe as a new addition to our board of elders. Uh, and Anita would be stepping onto the board as Sharon Hausenjan finishes up her term after many faithful years of service that we're so grateful for. Now, if you haven't had a chance to get to know Anita and her family yet, I hope that you will uh, because they are just wonderful people. Uh, and if you follow the, the link in the email, you'll be able to read a bit more about her. Voting is, of course, not the only thing that is happening online this month. Uh, lots of our groups are online this January. We've got youth, young professionals, young adults, cancer care, and our online prayer gatherings on Wednesday evening, all gathering online, and we would love for you to connect in this January with us. One thing that I would specifically uh, like to highlight is that our winter grief share and divorce care groups will be starting up this week. Um, they'll be gathering at 7 p.m. online. Uh, grief share on Mondays and divorce care on Thursdays. Um, and we know throughout the pandemic, there's been uh, many losses, many loved ones who've passed away. And we know that marriages have been struggling. Uh, and the loss of a marriage or the loss of a loved one can be an incredibly painful and disorienting thing to experience. Uh, but these groups can be a tremendous source of support to get through these kinds of difficult seasons. And so if that resonates for you, we would um, just want to encourage you to connect in with us this week. We'd love to welcome you to one of these groups. Uh, and for those of you who maybe aren't going through this in your own life, um, I just want to challenge you for a moment just to pause and think, uh, is there someone that the Lord is bringing to your mind? Uh, someone that you know could be encouraged by these groups? Uh, would you consider uh, just letting them know about Grief Share or Divorce Care and sending them the, the link so they can check it out and consider registering? Um, like I said, it's a, a tremendous source of support and uh, they won't regret connecting in. Uh, so they can do that through visiting northpark.ca slash register. Um, one final thing to let you know about is that over the next six weeks, Matt Loveday, our pastor of family ministries, will be releasing a weekly family moment. And, you know, as a church, we, we want to support and inspire and encourage you as families. And so this is one way uh, we can do that, do that. So in this short video series, Matt will be taking a moment each week to talk about our six core values here at North Park and what it can look like to incorporate and live out those values within our families. The first video was released this past week, and you can check it out by visiting our YouTube channel or following us on Facebook or subscribing to our weekly e-news and it just so happens that these are all great ways to keep up to date with all the opportunities happening here at North Park both on site and online and so be sure to follow and subscribe and all of those things and keep connected with us throughout the week so uh, that is it for our announcements today uh, so this time right here right now as we gather together for church uh, is a meaningful time where we can open God's wor word and learn together. And so uh, if you've been tracking with us the past couple of Sundays, you know that we're in the midst of a sermon series on the Holy Spirit that we've called uh, Deep Breath, Deep Breath. That's right. Uh, so as Paul comes up now to share today's message, I pray that you will be encouraged and uplifted as we reflect on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
Thanks, Trish. Good morning, everyone. Special hello to those watching online in our live stream service. You know, over the past few weeks, I've been intrigued by the ongoing conversation between parents and the government, our local school board and teachers, about the pros and cons between in-person versus online learning for our children. And it seems everyone has an opinion, usually a strong one. Now, at this stage in my life, I find myself kind of a passive bystander in this whole debate, as my children are all out of the public school system and my grandchildren haven't yet entered in. But on more than one occasion, I had to ask myself, how would I have managed if the circumstances would have forced me to attend class online back when I was in high school? And I think it would have been a disaster. My confession to you, my early high school years were less than stellar. And that was when I was in a classroom. I can't imagine being in my bedroom on a computer distracted by everything. In fact, in grade 9 and 10, I barely squeaked by, especially in silence, science. And I found grade 10 biology the worst. See, in my day in that class, we mostly learned about something called taxonomy. Is anyone familiar with this? Do they still teach this? Now, in this system, we learned to classify living things into a series of eight units. They were domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Does this ring a bell for anyone? Some of you. Now, to show you how confusing this system is, this is the way that you would classify a human being according to this system. Have a look at it. Yes. And we had to memorize that. Why? My brain just didn't seem to comprehend that system, and my test and my exam results revealed as much. I think I eked by with a final grade of 51%, probably purely out of the mercy of my teacher, who did not want me taking up space in his classroom for another year. Now imagine, imagine his surprise when I appeared seven short years later at his doorstep as a young teacher college student about to teach, you guessed it, grade 10 biology. God is a good God, amen? But there was a unit of study I did find fascinating in this grade 10 year. It was something called regeneration. You familiar with the phenomena of regeneration? See, regeneration is this natural process where plants and animals can replace or restore damaged or missing body parts to full function. And I remember being bewildered that a salamander can lose its tail in a fight with its prey, but no problem, it can grow back again. Or how a starfish can drop or release, I guess it's called their arm, if they were attacked by a predator or if they were stuck in some rocks. They could escape, they just drop the arm and it'll grow back later. Now, can you imagine being able to do that? Anytime someone grabbed you by the arm, no problem. You let it go, it'll grow back in time. And regeneration does occur to some degree in our physical bodies. Some of our tissues, such as skin, or some organs, such as our liver, can regenerate. And there's many more, much research being done to discover how to facilitate regeneration in other parts of our body to work toward overall physical health and well-being. It's an intriguing idea for sure, but I wonder if you knew this. I wonder if you knew the concept of regeneration is of great importance to Jesus in the Bible. In fact, in the Gospel of John chapter 3, a religious teacher named Nicodemus visits Jesus at night. He's on a bit of a fact-finding mission. He wants to know more about Jesus and the kingdom that he's come to proclaim. Listen to the exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3 at verse 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. To be born again, it, it means the beginning of our life as a Christian it's to be spiritually regenerated, and it's only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, have I piqued your interest a little bit? As Trish said, a few weeks ago, we launched our new year with this new teaching series on the Holy Spirit at North Park that we've entitled Deep Breath, Life in the Spirit. In the first week, I described how that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, now lives in us, and it gives us the strength, and it gives us the power to live our Christian life. 
Last week, Chris, Trish reminded us that at times when it seems like God is distant, he isn't. He is there, not only with us, but he is in us that allows us to face whatever comes our way. And today, as I said, I want to take a closer look at the Spirit's role in regenerating our lives. Now, maybe you remember a bit of my message from a few weeks ago. I said that in the Bible, it describes the way that God's Spirit animates things. It brings them to life. And nowhere is that more powerfully depicted than in Genesis 2 at verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life. We just sang about that, right? He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. God creates humanity, and then he animates. And how does he do it? He breathes his breath into man's nostrils, and man came alive. The word here is ruach. God breathed his ruach, his presence, or his energy into humanity right from the beginning. That's what gives us life initially. See, just as nothing can live biologically apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, so no human can be alive in God without the work of the Spirit. Let's look again at the exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus that I mentioned a few moments ago. Look at John chapter 3 at verse 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again... You can't see the kingdom of God. Born again. Are you familiar with this expression? I mean, in our society today, the media often uses this term as a bit of a derogatory term meant toward those who are pious or self-righteous Christians. You're not one of those born-againers, are you? In fact, I heard it just this week on a television show used in a negative way. It would be like calling someone a Bible thumper or a holy roller. But in the biblical context, to be born again, it means to experience a new beginning. It's a fresh start. Now, you may know that the English word generate means to initiate or to start something. I've got to get a job so I can generate some income. In the Greek language of the New Testament, the word translated generate means to start, to become, to happen. And therefore, the meaning of the word regenerate is to start again. Regeneration by the Holy Spirit means to radically change into a new kind of being. Now, it doesn't mean that we go from the human to the divine, but it does mean that with the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, it changes us from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Spiritually dead human beings are not capable of truly compre comprehending the things of Jesus. They're not capable of understanding the kingdom of God and all the things of God. It is beyond their grasp because they just don't get it because they are spiritually dead. When our family was together for a few days over Christmas, one of the things we really like to do is to play games. When you're together with your family, you guys like to play games? Wizard is a family favorite for us, and this year we got into this game called Clask, thanks to Jordan Elgie back there, and for some strange reason that is beyond me, they started playing chess. And it seemed every time I turned around, someone was involved in some intense game of chess. My sons, my son-in-laws, even Carolyn got involved, and they were loving it. Now, I never learned the game of chess, and honestly, I never really had a desire to learn it. I would occasionally pop by the table where they were playing, but I was clueless. I didn't understand. I didn't get the appeal because I didn't know the nuances of the game. I was on the outside looking in. Unless I would learn more about chess, I would never get it. And that's a key word, unless. And that's a key word in Jesus' exchange with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I tell you the truth, unless... Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. When Jesus uses that word unless in speaking to Nicodemus, he is saying it's a necessary condition. Unless you have oxygen, a fire won't ignite. Unless you turn that key, your car won't start. Unless you score at least one goal, you are never going to win the game. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That word unless means that being born again or being regenerated is a necessary condition to seeing or even entering into the kingdom of God. It's a necessary thing for knowing the things of God. Do we understand that? Good. Because Nicodemus didn't. Jesus' teaching seemed to puzzle him. 
And so he responds in John chapter 3 at verse 4. What do you mean? Exclaims Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Now it's hard to tell here whether Nicodemus' query is actually genuine or whether it's just frustrated sarcasm because he rather glibly suggests that what Jesus may mean by being born again is that a fully grown human being has to attempt the impossible. They have to attempt to return to their mother's womb and physically be born all over again. But he's missed the point. He's missed the point of the difference between biological birth and spiritual birth. So Jesus answers him at verse 5. I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. And again, words are really important here. When Jesus says, I assure you, he is stating that without regeneration, no one, no one is able to enter the kingdom of God. There's no exceptions. We cannot experience salvation without spiritual rebirth. And I think this runs a little counter to what our society is propagating about the whole idea of what it means to be a Christian these days. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, we often hear that to be a Christian means you just do nice things for people. You care for people. You care for the planet. And therefore, you're a Christian. This might surprise you this morning, but no one is born a Christian. It does not matter if you're born into a home that's been going to church or serving God for generations. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you're the offspring of Billy Graham, Martin Luther, or the Queen of England herself. No one is born a Christian. We are not birthed biologically into the kingdom of God. Our first birth, when we're expelled from our mother's womb, it's of the flesh. Anyone in here ever witnessed the birth of a human being? Yeah, some of you were there when your own kids were born. I was by my wife's side dutifully when she gave birth to our children. And let me tell you, as great as a miracle as it is, it was messy and it was fleshy. I'll spare you all the details, but let's just say, flesh begets flesh. It can't produce spirit. And flesh? Flesh is an interesting word in the Bible. The biblical idea of flesh often refers to humanity's sinful nature. See, prior to the Spirit's work of regeneration in our life, we predominantly live by the flesh, and we live for the flesh. Our behavior and our conduct is most often dictated by the patterns of the world, and mostly they're in contradiction to the ways of God. So I hate to burst your bubble a little bit this morning, but that cute and cuddly and adorable newborn baby enters the world into a tainted state. Because we're all born into our trespasses. Even King David put it this way in Psalm 51 at verse 5. I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. The consequences of Adam and Eve's sin and disobedience transmitted a corrupted fleshy nature to all of humanity. Flesh begets flesh. It can't produce spirit. And that's why Jesus emphasizes he reiterates to Nicodemus in the next verse, verse 7. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be regenerated into a new life by the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. That is a true mark of being a Christian. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in Ephesians 2. Let me, let me just read this to you. Just listen to these words. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy... And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. See, Paul paints a pretty graphic picture of our lives and what they're like when we live in the flesh before the work of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. In a word, we're dead. We're dead. Well, we're not physically dead, but we're spiritually dead. We're marred in sin. We're marred in disobedience to God. We're following the ways of the world, and we're following the master of the world, the devil. Our lives are lost. But in the midst of all of this death, in the midst of this flesh, and this despair, and this, this lack of any hope, God comes through. God loves us so much. Even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. 
That same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in all of us through the Holy Spirit. And you may be wondering, well, how, Paul? How, how does that Spirit live in us? It lives in us when we receive Him. When we acknowledge our sins and our failings, when we acknowledge our need to turn to Jesus and what he's accomplished on the cross, when we turn control and direction of our lives over to him and enter into new birth and new life in him, then we are regenerated. Listen to how it explains it in Romans 8 at verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. So, The way of the world living in flesh is death, but the way of the Spirit is life. It's eternal life. It's to be born again. It is new birth. It is regeneration. And it's important for us to understand that regeneration always, it always starts with the work of God through the Holy Spirit. When it came time for my oldest son, Scott, to be born, Carolyn had a lot of difficulty. After 25 hours of painful labor, he went into distress And a quick ultrasound revealed that he was in a transverse position, which simply meant that he wasn't head down, but he was sideways in the uterus. An emergency C-section was booked, and everything worked out well, but he gave us some moments of anxiousness, that's for sure. The point is this. A baby can do nothing to assist in the process of birth. In fact, it maybe even gets in the way. It is fully dependent on a doctor or a nurse or a midwife or its own mother Just like that, we can do nothing to control being born again, to be regenerated. That is God's domain. That is God's control. God alone does that through the Holy Spirit, gives us new life through his grace to those who trust in him. It's just like that familiar passage in Ephesians 2 expresses it. It says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. And then think of those familiar words found in John 3.16. I think you know it. It explains why God offers us new birth and a regenerated life. It says this, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only one and only son. Why did he do that? Why did he give his one and only son? So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God gave us Jesus. He saved us so that we would no longer be dead in our sins, but we would have life eternal in him and with him. So let me ask you this morning, are you born again? Are you regenerated? Have you received by faith all that the Spirit has done for you through the death and the resurrection of Jesus? If so, then Scripture tells us that this regeneration has transformed us into a new kind of being. It's transformed us into a new creation. Not only are we saved from sin, but we're saved into a whole new way of living, a whole new way of life. And it's described in 2 Corinthians 5 at verse 17. This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. A new life has begun where we're no longer controlled by our sinful nature. We're no longer controlled by the flesh, but instead we're controlled by the Spirit of God who lives in us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that cool? So given that, wouldn't you expect that the way that we live our new regenerated life in the Spirit would be different, radically different, than the way that we lived before we had the Spirit? Wouldn't you think so? Wouldn't you think that the way that we live now, when we have the Spirit of God in us, would be radically different than the way that we lived before we had the Spirit? I mean, if I told you that I replaced my 11-inch, 1499 Canadian Tire plastic shovel with a 28-inch Toro Power Dual Max snowblower you would expect that my ability to remove snow from my driveway would be greatly enhanced, wouldn't you? It would be life-changing. It would be life-changing if I had a snowboard. (laughs) It'd be life-changing. There'd be no more slugging it out. I could do every driveway on the block. Is that the way that you're living your life today with the power of the Holy Spirit in you? Is it different from the way that you lived your life under your own strength before you became a Christian? You would think so, wouldn't you? But sadly, I don't think it is for a lot of people. Why is that? 
Well, maybe it's because some of us really don't believe that we need the Holy Spirit, or maybe we don't expect the Spirit to act in our lives. Or, or if so, maybe our expectations are somewhat misguided, or maybe they're self-serving, or, or, or maybe given some of our own natural talent and experience and education, many of us feel that we're capable of living quite adequately in the world today without the Spirit. We're so used to doing it ourselves that we forget. We forget that we can tap into it. And I think sometimes that's a danger in our churches too. Because let's be honest, if we're not careful, we can do much of what we do in a church service like this under our own strength and under our own power, right? We can completely ignore the work of the Spirit. Oh, we can combine a really talented worship team with a decent speaker. We can add a few creative elements and people will come. But that doesn't mean the Spirit of God is actively moving and working in the lives of people. It just means that we may be entertaining the masses for one or two hours every Sunday. I wonder, when people walk out the doors of this building or when they shut off the live stream feed, are they moved, are they touched by the Spirit to worship and to praise God? Are they drawn closer to God and the hope that He has to offer their life? Or are they just happy, hey, we sang our favorite song? Or at least the preacher was entertaining this week. Is the Holy Spirit presence in our midst? Do we expect him to show up? Do we anticipate what he's going to do in our lives? Oh, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. Do we believe that? And do we expect that? Maybe the bigger challenge is this. When we move outside the walls of this building each week and we go into those places that God has called us, When we go into our homes, we go into our neighborhoods, we go into our schools or our workplaces, can anyone really see the impact the Holy Spirit's making in our life? I mean, is there any difference between the way we treat people, the way we engage in circumstances or situations than anyone else? And that's a personal challenge to me. Because you know what? There are times when my non-Christian neighbors and friends seem more joyful. They seem more at peace and more welcoming than I do. Let me get back to that snow shoveling moment. A couple of weeks ago, after a relatively modest amount of snow had fallen overnight, I was up early to clear off my driveway and to clear off the walkway. It was still dark, but I was on a bit of a timeline because I had to pick up one of our facility staff who needed to be at the church by 7.30. All was going well, and I was almost done. I was just finishing off the walkway, and suddenly I heard someone yell, Hey, Paul, and it startled me because, remember, it was dark and it was early, I looked up to see one of my neighbors just standing at the foot of my driveway, and honestly, my confession to you, my heart sank because I was on a timeline. I needed to get done in a few moments. I needed to finish up so I could go and pick up my colleague and we could come to church and praise God together. I knew this neighbor was going through a bit of a tough time. He'd been carrying through his sick mom through COVID, and it had taken a toll for sure. And I guess he had been up early, saw me outside, decided he wanted to talk, to tell me how his mom was doing. And we had a good discussion, but I was convicted about my attitude after he left. Instead of seeing this as an opportunity to maybe offer him a little support or a listening ear, or maybe more importantly, to demonstrate the love of Jesus to him, I looked at him as an interruption to my fanatical obsession with time. Has that ever happened to you? You turn an opportunity into an interruption. As a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit in me. I'm dead to sin. I am born again. I'm a new creation. I have life. Yet there's times that I don't tap into that, sp- that power that's in me. My words and my actions demonstrate little difference between my life and anyone else. And that leaves an opening for people to question me, question my integrity, question my faith, and more importantly, question my God. Thank you. And maybe you resonate with my sentiments. You ever been frustrated by your own behavior? Thinking, I'm a Christian. I've got spirit in me. I'm supposed to be born again, regenerated, a new creation. Why do I keep reverting back to my old way of life? Have you ever asked yourself that? And maybe for you, maybe for you it's anger. Maybe anger just keeps coming up in your life for whatever reason. You don't want it to. Or or maybe for you, there's this temptation, "Ah, I'm going to fudge a little bit on my taxes. Or or maybe for you, it's watching TV and you're flicking through the channels and you pause maybe too long at something that's inappropriate. Maybe that's for you. I want you to take heart. 
You're not alone. Even the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul shared your frustration when he says this in Romans 7 at verse 18. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It's sin living in me that does it. Yes, Paul, it's sin living in you. Yes, it's sin living in us. See, if you made a decision to become a Christian, then you're born again. And you have the Spirit of God living in you, but this side of heaven, there's still some flesh. There's still some flesh. Each day, in every decision and situation, we need to lean on the Spirit. We need to call on the Spirit. We need to let the Spirit dictate the way that we act, not the flesh. Again, let's look at what the Apostle Paul says, because what we just discovered is he knows how we feel. So he says this in Galatians 5.16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under the obligation of the law of Moses. You know that interaction that I had with my neighbor I shared with you a moment ago? I faced a really real battle internally with, inside me. The battle was between my sinful nature and what the Spirit wanted. My sinful nature wanted to say to him, hey, I don't have time for you today. I'm in a hurry. Please go away. The Spirit wanted me to take a chill pill, wanted me to relax, live in the moment, Paul, listen with love and compassion. And I was conflicted, but the Spirit convicted me. And that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit in us does. It, conv it convicts us to do the right thing. It convicts us to do the best thing. And in that morning, even though I had a spiritual battle waging inside of me, I eventually did, as the Apostle Paul says, I let the Spirit guide my life. And as I said earlier, we ended up having a good discussion. But that doesn't always happen. Confession, sometimes I can go the other way. Sometimes I can behave poorly. Sometimes the flesh wins out. And I'll spare you all the details of those cringeworthy moments. But here's what I've learned in those times of seeming defeat. The Spirit has not abandoned me. The Spirit convicts me of my behavior, leads me to repentance, allows me to receive the forgiveness that Christ has already given me through the cross, and then the Spirit wipes me clean. See, the process of regeneration leads to transformation, which is not stagnant. It is ongoing all throughout our life. In Romans 12, too, it says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Changing the way we think is an ongoing process. The marvelous work of the Spirit regenerating our life is really all about transformation. Because ultimately, here's what God's desire is for you and for me. His desire is that we cast off the desires of the flesh and we grow in holiness. We grow to become more like Jesus. But we can't do it under our own power. Have you tried? You just get frustrated. But we can only do it by choosing to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. If you are sitting here today or if you're watching during, but via live stream, let me just say, if you find yourself in a real battle between the temptations of the flesh and the way of the Spirit, if you find yourself even today in a battle like that, I hope my words that I've just shared with you have given you some hope. You don't have to give in. You don't have to give up. You have the strength right inside you that you can overcome because the Bible tells us is greater that the spirit that is in you than the spirit that's in the world. And there's so many ways the Holy Spirit works in our life. He transforms us into a new being through regeneration. He convicts us of our sin and leads us to repentance. He empowers us to live the Christian life. He guides us in truth. He guides us in wisdom. He draws us closer to God. He draws us closer to one another. He gives us gifts and abilities to serve the church and the body and to edify him. And he allows us in our lives to bear fruit. Now, some of these things we're going to unpack a little bit more in the weeks ahead. There are so many ways that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, but all of the ways, all of the ways share one common goal. Anyone want to know what the common goal is? So that we grow to be more like Jesus. So we grow in holiness. 
God wants you to be holy. And he's given you his spirit to aid in that regenerated life. So let me ask you, are you born again? Have you given your life to Jesus? And if so, let me just encourage you, where you are right now, tap into that spirit that is in you. Let him guide you to live the best life that he's always dreamed for you through his strength and through his power. And if not, if you've never given your life to Jesus, today can be the day. Today can be the day where you are born again. You are born into a new and a vibrant and a hopeful life that God has in mind for you. The only question I will ask you is, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you for your rich word. So powerful. Just the the words of Jesus exchanged with Nicodemus. Here was a man searching, a man wanting to know. He was curious. What is it about this life that you're proclaiming, Jesus? And Jesus challenged him with, with going deeper. And God, at first, Nicodemus didn't get it. And I can imagine at first he walked away and was maybe a little frustrated. But we know the story as it goes on throughout the Gospel of John that eventually Nicodemus did turn, did turn back and accept what Jesus' life and death had to offer him. And you saved him. And so for some of us sitting here today, God, we've experienced the life-transforming role that the Holy Spirit can play, play in our life. We've accepted that, God. And so the challenge for us today is each day, that we tap into that. Oh, we know this side of heaven, there's still this battle going on, but God, we know that we can tap into your spirit. That can overcome the desires and temptations of the evil one. And so we pray, God, that we can look to you to overcome those temptations and to let your spirit lead us. You are there, you're regenerating us. And God, for some maybe sitting here or for others maybe watching at home, maybe they've never made that commitment. Maybe they're sitting here and they've got this curiosity about the things of Jesus, especially given uh, the situation we find ourselves in the world today. There's this spiritual yearning, this spiritual desire to learn and to grow more. I pray, God, that they understand all that you've done, why you sent Jesus. They understand the power of the Spirit They understand, God, that we can live our lives relying on the flesh, and and that takes us in all the wrong directions. Sin overcomes our life. It dissuades us from living the life that you've called us to do. God, I pray today, maybe that decision can be made where these people surrender all of that, turn that all over to you, repent of the way they've been trying to live their life under their own strength, and they invite you through your spirit to wipe them clean, to give them new life, regenerate them, and then allow them to begin their journey as new creations directed by your spirit. God, all it is is just a decision to accept you, receive you, turn from their old way of life, and invite you to direct their lives. God, I pray that people would do that to understand just the amazing new life that you have to offer. Thank you, God, for the challenge today. We pray and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Paul. I would invite you to stand as we close with this last song.
deserve it still you give yourself away all oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Just like our own individual lives, there's occasion in the life in the church where we periodically have a difficult time. And in those moments, we too have to go before the Spirit. And we have to invite the Spirit to convict us, to demonstrate to us ways that maybe we went the wrong way. Maybe we behaved the wrong way. And we have to invite God to forgive us. He's already forgiven us. But confess that and invite him to regenerate and cleanse us 
But the good news is he does when we lean on him and then has a bright and a hopeful future in mind for us. And I know he has that in mind for North Park Church. Amen? Next week, we are keeping with our regular 11 a.m. service. But the week after, let's open it up again. 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, the first week of February. And then in two weeks after that, let's open up Saturday night. Let's open it up. The end of February, let's get back to what we were used to, what we know. Protocols are opening a little bit. So two weeks, 9 o'clock, a couple of weeks after that, February, I don't know the date, 24 first or something all three services and we're going to we're going to look forward to all that God wants to do in and through us because at North Park Church it's a new chapter saying that we have two exciting positions available to be filled on our staff we have one administrative assistant position that we need filled and then we have what we're calling a creative communication assistant that we want to look for in our church. That means all the ways that we get the gospel of Jesus Christ out through multimedia, social media, online. We're looking for someone who can creatively dream of ways that we can do that in a better way because it's about the message of Jesus Christ reaching as many people as possible. Amen? So if you know anyone that may be gifted and talented and want to join an amazing team, let us know in the office. Great future ahead when we trust in him. God bless you and have a hopeful week.